Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at Artist Talk with LVA. I'm the host, Keith Waits. The show's produced by Louisville Visual Art. And you are listening to WXOX 97.1 FM in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, today, I have uh, four guests who are in an exhibit coming up at Pyro Gallery. It's uh, called Zek, featuring uh, Susie Zimmer, Julie Edberg, Nancy Courier, and Keith Kleespies. Uh, the show runs August 5th to the 28th. There's an opening reception on the 5th, 6 to 9 p.m., a gallery talk on the 7th at 2 p.m. Uh, it, ha it has been described by the artists that you're about to hear as unexpected, infectious, idiosyncratic, and fun. Uh, so those four people are Nancy Courier, who is a member of Pyro Gallery and a part of the Zet Group, and she invited them all in to, the, to do this exhibit. We've got uh, Keith Kleespies and Susie Zimmer and uh, Julie Edberg. And uh, I'm not going to get into long uh, introductions on all these uh, on all these people, except to say they have uh, all been making art for uh, a long time. They are they are in very serious artists uh, who are <laughs> who are uh, I think maybe having a lot of fun in this show. So uh, welcome all of you. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy, Thanks. let's start with you. So. Um, Okay. You, you, this is your slot as a Pyro member. That's right. But on the calendar. And you could have had just a show of your own work, although it's, it is, I will say, you know, uh, it's a very common thing. I don't know how much it's expected or required or anything, but uh, it seems like all Pyro artists do bring in somebody. Like they rarely have a show that's entirely their work. There's always an invitation. But why, why did you br want to bring the Zek group uh, into, into this uh, space right now? Um, well, for a couple reasons. One, because I thought, I mean, three years ago we did this and that was the first sack, mm -hmm. but I thought uh, it would be a fantastic show if I could get three of my favorite artists to show with me. And there's plenty of room at Pyro. Yeah. So um, that was really the second reason too, but it was, a, you know, the back door reason. Uh, that I thought, how can I fill all that space? But anyhow, so, and with Pyro, it's pretty open whatever you want to do. If you have a guest, you have to, uh, a couple months before the show, bring in examples or let people know what the guests do and that. And then if anybody objects, has never happened, um, then that's it with the guests. But, you know, they're really open and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and just for anybody who doesn't know, Pyro is a co-op gallery, so it's, right. it's it's run by the member artists and uh, yeah. some of them have been involved for, for right. We do uh, it all. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's all done. Yeah, which is beautiful. Uh, right now, it's the only co-op gallery in town, right? I think. Yes, it is. Uh huh. So, and let's also, uh, and, and I, you can answer this, but if anybody else wants to answer it instead. What is Zek? Where does Zek come from as an idea or a concept or a connection between the four of you? It's just an acronym of our last names. So, you know, just like you introduced us, Susie Zimmer, you introduced us perfectly in order for Zek. That's all it is. It okay. sounds good, Zek. <laughs> um, so, but, so then let me take that question a little deeper then. What is it that brings the four of you together and bonds the four of you? But I mean, you, you've maybe known each other a long time, but what is it that, I'll tell you what, let, let's ask, uh, let's start with Keith Cleesby's on this. Uh, what, what is it about the four of you and what bonds you together as artists? They, uh, we all like to have fun. We all um, a little zany. Um, it's, an, it's exciting to be able to play with the other three. Uh, it's not formal. These people aren't formal, none of them. Um, yeah, it's, it's a chance to be exuberant and uh, have some fun and play. So, uh, these, these, my friends here uh, are all that way individually. So it's just a bigger gang of clowns. <laughs> Well, we take clowns seriously, by the way. Well, before we started recording, we were actually talking about the 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 serious underpinnings of silliness and uh, and uh, and being a clown, being a clown, being a clown is a very serious thing. And you know, you can go to college to be a clown. You can get a degree in being a clown, so it should be taken seriously. Susie, um, uh, 
is there much collaboration among the four or is every you know or is it everybody's doing their own work i think everybody's doing their own work and and i i would add that um i think we respect each other greatly and are excited to be surprised by each other we know that we will be surprised by what each other does and that will be um you know, inspiring as well as fun, as well as mysterious and weird. And we welcome all that. We've not seen uh, Julie's work and we've only happened to have seen a little of Nancy's work. So when we get to the gallery to install it, uh, I think we're all excited to see what's going on. They haven't seen any of ours. So, um, well, well, let me just, cause Keith, you and Susie, uh, our partners. So is that, does that still go for you guys? Do you keep, do you, or do you look at each other's work and give feedback or are you able to surprise each other? <laughs> okay. Susie um, keeps her work pretty much to herself. I've seen very little of it. Uh, she has jumped in to help me. She has collaborated with me. Some of the pieces in the show are absolute collaborations a uh, few of them are more her than me, but they'll have my name on them. Um, He's being modest. No. I just, I just assist. Well, that's how she likes to frame it, but that's <laughs> not true. It's a collaboration. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's an odd partnership here, but she's, she has helped me tremendously. Been a big part of what I've done. Yeah, you know, we, you know, people find it surprising that we don't critique each other's work and you know, I've known you for a long time and I've known your work and what you do and what your spirit is. And it's all wonderful and exciting. There's nothing to critique. It's just, no. you know, yeah. I, we, we and, and again, we, we play, we play. Yeah, so we're, we're our own little private yeah. Zach group as well. <laughs> Sub Zach. <laughs> Sub Zach, yeah. Well, you could just be Z. Or no, it'd be Z. Or cuz. Or cuz. <laughs> yeah. Cuz is slightly easier to say, but it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Julie, let's but, bring. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see um, Nancy's and Julie's work. I think it's going to be really fun. Well, Julie, let's get you in here uh, a little bit. So, what can you tell us about your work that's going to be in this exhibit without spoiling the surprise for the other three? <laughs> Three years ago, I believe it was mostly sort of clothing, and now it's uh, sort of a lot of blob shapes. <laughs> and there's a COVID monster, there's a crabby monster, there's some globe entities, they're all very round. There's a Mr. Thingy. So they have more personalities and oftentimes they have legs and eyes and I love them. <laughs> okay. They're, they're very huggable. Okay, so you, I, I think it's probably fair to say and, and you, any of you can contradict, contradict me as we come around, but all of you are multimedia artists. You know, in, in my experience, I've, I've, you know, I've seen all sorts of different materials get used. Sounds like a lot of your stuff, Julie, right now is, but you said soft, like they're huggable. So, so you're, you're maybe working more with soft materials right now. Okay. They are huggable, but they're cardboard um, little tiles tied together ah. with knots. And they have a, an armature of cardboard and a lot of glue. <laughs> oh, okay. So well, they won't, they won't flatten, but. They feel really nice, so you could try hugging it, hugging one. But it's not uh, my, my assumption that they were somehow maybe you were involving fabric and things like no, that. No, it's paper, yeah. but it's sort of fabric-like since they're tied together with string. Right, right. It does sound almost like you've constructed them like a uh, like a fabric piece, but but not using the mm -hmm. <laughs> tiles tied together. Yeah, come see. 
will always come see, as I like to say, and I'll repeat it. And I've said it, I've said it, I don't know, probably in more than half the shows, um, no matter how many websites you look at, no matter how many things you see on social media, uh, those are great ways to find out about what's going on, but always, 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 always go to the gallery, get in the space with the work, whatever the medium, whatever it's, it's just, that's really how the work should be uh, viewed. And, and that should be your relationship as a viewer should always be based on being in the space with the work. Um, I, 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 I always worry that people feel like with the amount of information, digital information coming to them and they can find pictures of anything that's happening in the world and anything anybody's doing, it is just not the same. You've got to get in the room. Um, well, the point, Keith, about we've not seen each other's work. Uh, no, we have to be with it to really see and understand what's going on. We've, we've seen a few pictures of each other's work, but that's totally inadequate. It would believe in the experience. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think I've, I've said, even if the images are digital, digital photographs or digital illustrations or, or images, um, I have found that, again, to be in the gallery space is very different than looking at them online. And part of it, of course, is the way an artist puts the work in place and what the relationships are, what's next to each other, what's across the room, what's the size and the scale and... Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that make a difference in that viewer's experience beyond seeing it on a computer screen. Thank you yeah. for that. But Nancy? and that that part, I think I don't know about all artists, but I think most artists, if they're having a show, the gallery, the actual physical gallery, is in, always in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Like I normally, or I just naturally go towards small, but because I knew I had all this space in the gallery, I pushed myself to go bigger. And I don't know, I haven't come to a conclusion on how I feel about those pieces or think about those pieces, but it, I do have an interaction with the gallery itself while I'm making the pieces. Well, and pyro is a very individual space, it seems to me, you know, it's, it does have a lot of space, but it, you know, when you say that in, in this context, when we're not showing anybody what pyro looks like, if you've never been in the space and you say there's a lot of space, people might imagine uh, something like the, the pyro that used to be down on Market Street, you know, tall ceilings, large white walls that extend, you know, and, and pyro is a, a, it does have a lot of room, but it's also a very intimate, it's an intimate series of rooms um and there's also a good amount of uh, daylight involved in uh, you know uh, windows and stuff like that and coming in that it's then in in some ways it's a very um very warm um uh space very warm and inviting yeah. i think it's very warm and it's friendly and also it's there are three galleries that we'll use three rooms in other words within the gallery and i think that each room has its own personality too so, yeah, I, I like where the gallery is now. I like that location a lot. Well, Nancy, let's, uh, since, and since you're the Pyro member, we'll give you, give you the opportunity now. Talk a little bit about your work. You just said that you were pushing to do some stuff uh, that was larger than your usual output. Talk a little bit about right. what we might expect to see. And again, without spoiling any surprises, but <laughs> what's, what's happening in your work that's, that's going to be in the gallery? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of what that is. It's, um, what well, with the past three years, it just so happened to be the past three years of uh, a lot of craziness out in the world. And, uh, so I was trying to think what is going on and does it interact with what's going on outside of me within the world and that, how that affects me. So, uh, I go back to what you said about, um, unseriousness and what he said about the play is the thing I can't I cannot I do not want to have any of that seriousness go into my work so um I use the hodgepodge material I use a lot of paper mache even though I want to use I want to carve wood but I haven't gotten that skill yet so I use paper mache 
So I have some paper mache figures and they're bigger than usual. Usually they're that big. Now they're about 17, 18 inches tall. You're on the radio. Pardon me? Can't say that big. Oh, oh, okay. Well, she said 17, 18. Well, so yeah, but they are you, now. Your first comparison six, was maybe yeah, six, six or eight. inches to 70. Yeah, like I'm trying, I tried to triple, triple them. Yeah. And then um, it's hard for me though. So to get bigger. So what I do is uh, for the flat two dimensional pieces, I'll work in uh, like 10 by 10 or four by four uh, tiles that I put together to form the whole image. So I know it's fake, but yeah, come see it. And um, yeah. Um, oh, one thing, I, I do have a series in there that I think comes closest to how um, the exterior world has affected me. And it's a, a series called the antidepressants and the antidepressants do things. And the one that is reflective of what's going on is uh, the antidepressants talk politics. So I, that's the only time I let what's going on come into my work. Well, what are, and, what are the antidepressants? What are you, what are you saying? They're talking politics. That's what they're no, saying. No. Who's talking politics? <laughs> the antidepressants. Who are the antidepressants? There's two of them talking together. Pills. It sounds like maybe they are characters. <laughs> they are who they are. It makes sense when you see them. It makes total sense. They have a whole bunch of friends, too. <laughs> <laughs> All antidepressants. This is a very zany group. <laughs> well, uh, so Keith and uh, Susie, let's come back to you. Uh, let's let uh, Keith, you first, just because you're on the left and I'm left to right, of course. Uh, talk about the same question. What can you tell us about your work without giving too much away? It, that's going to be in this show. It's an installation. It is um, toy-based. Uh, I have an interest in tin toy ro robots, lots of images of those things, um, assemblages of robot figures, uh, puppets. Um, scale is from very small to very large. Um, it will be an environment. Now it's an odd little gallery. It's, it's small, Susie's on one side, I'm on the other. Um, her work is very elegant and quiet, and mine is very brash and noisy. Uh, a, a curious space to be in, but I will uh, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, use mine in a very large and colorful way. Mm. And Susie? Um, I've got 32 envelopes that are watercolored. Um, I guess what I would say is sort of a repeat of my statement that um, I imagined a sender of the letters, Isla Frankwater, who um, decorated or painted the envelopes and sent them to various friends and family. And for some unknown reason, these 32 have been saved and there they are. Um, and once I had done these envelopes, including inventing stamps um, and inventing cancellations for them, I realized, well, an envelope needs addressees. So they need someone to go to. So I invented a world of people that would receive them and research their addresses and their lives and thought about it and wrote a lot of notes. and. And then I realized, oh, well, the envelopes want letters. So um, that's how that happened. But really it's about the imagery, which is a collection of all sorts of little bits and bobs and um, honoring various artists and writers and ideas appear on the envelopes. But there are also letters in the envelopes, real there, letters. There's le handwritten, handwritten letters, letters in the envelopes that I imagined uh, Isla has written and they've been saved for some reason. 
So, so as a, the viewers will not be able to read the letters, right? Correct. But, but we will know that there are letters. It's not just a concept. There are actual letters in each. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Every, yeah. Everyone says, Oh, we, you know, that's kind of a clever idea. Well, I didn't intend it as a clever idea. I didn't intend to write the letters at all. I made these envelopes, which really um, was about compositions that happened to be on the format of an envelope. Mm -hmm. And then they became real uh, mailed envelopes with real letters inside. So the letters were kind of an afterthought, but I did work hard on the, on the letters. Um, there'll be a sample letter that hangs up for people to read. And if you want to know the contents, well, you know, you got to read, you got, you got to get one. You got to get one of the letters or the envelopes, but it's really about the envelopes. Right. Well, but it also, it's interesting that it's an epistolary uh, art installation, which is a not, maybe not unprecedented, but certainly a rare sort of occurrence. No, no, it's, it's a, it's a, a thing that people have yeah. done. Yeah, but it's sort of, you know, the, the one image, and it's one image only that I saw uh, uh, from, from this, you know, it really made me think about when, whenever you do, when, you know, whenever you're reading the history or biography of somebody from an earlier time, uh, maybe early, in the early 20th century and things like that, where letters were so important, so crucial, those letters are often quite beautiful, the, the envelopes, you know, and, and often deceptively simple when you, and I think that we live in a time where most of our, you know, people don't do that like they used to do. Right. That. right. Or most of our physical mail is commercially produced and, you know, and junk mail. And so, so I find it very interesting what you're doing. And, and, and so I can't wait to see that. Well, good. Thank you. I hope <laughs> it's fun. You know, I, I have to say that, uh, um, I would love I would, I would love it most if people enjoyed looking at them and thought, oh gosh, I would love to do that too. Make up a person and write stories and letters. Mm -hmm. So that would be the biggest reward if somebody or everybody decided they wanted to play that game themselves. Mm -hmm. Keith, Keith, I wanna add one of the things I have been aware of during Susie's process is the intensity of her research, the addresses, are actual places in appropriate neighborhoods to the recipients of the letters. All the, all the details are there as a novelist would create them, um, trying to be very realistic. Uh, she's, she's worked extremely hard to make this uh, a serious effort. Well, and it's interesting too, because it's, yeah. so, so far in these in these descriptions of the you've each given of your work, Susie's is perhaps the most detailed, and I think on its surface, doesn't sound necessarily like the kind of fun that we're, we're seeing. Yeah, I, I, think <laughs> I you know. know yeah, I know. You know. You know, Keith. I, you know. I have to say, I've said for some time. You know, I, to Keith, you and and Nancy and Julie have got all these great, wonderful, zany things and. And here I am with these kind of serious letters. But, but I think um, if you were to read the letters, which of course, almost nobody will read all of them, you would see that Isla is a very playful person. So the but, play is hiding. <laughs> but also, I'm like here, jumping on the edge of my seat. I think there's a magic about them. And, oh, and, and one, but, but just them, you know, visually seeing them in the story and all, but also the fact that you're not letting anybody except whoever goes and buys your piece of art to read what's inside. There's something magical and secretive. And I found that fun. Well, you know? thanks. Yeah. A whole lot like her. <laughs> well, no, and I, th I think that's what I, that was the, the point I was getting to what you guys are saying is that, you know, it broadens the idea of what fun is, um, because you created all of this, like if you had, like if you had gone through and, and somehow tried to imagine and recreate and all these people were just totally real people, that's a different kind of thing that also could be very worthwhile. But this is, I mean, 
you have created there's a lot of depth to it but i think it's still fun it's still fun and thank you i think it should be fun yeah maybe it's fun. maybe it's not whimsical and like there's other kinds of words we could say that might apply and you might disagree with that that, that might apply to some of the other artists work but I, I i like that idea that it broadens our concept of of what uh uh, of what fun is and sort of, uh, um, you know, because it, it could be it can be fun to touch base with a different time period. In well, and, yes, yeah. and, it, and research for me is a lot of fun. But yeah. I want to say about my three companions in Zek mm -hmm. that while their work, you could say zany, you could say whimsical, but I think each one is very, very serious um, as, as a human being in regards to, to all the issues that are important to, uh, to a nice human being. And, and I think it's contained within their work. And I think their presentation of it in a, in a way that many people might consider zany or wacky is, is just a way in to bigger issues. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think there's a lot of great tradition in, in American culture of comedians or humorists. We think about, you know, some of the great writers that were humorous in our in our history, you know, touching on the seriousness of things or or using satire, you know, there, that 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 that's I mean, you know, a lot of people was it just a few years ago, you know, people were saying like they learned more about what was going on in the world by watching John Stewart on The Daily Show, you know, I mean, but because mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I think part of that comes from the fact that we have such a hard time sometimes dealing with what's going on in the world that that's the only way maybe some people can sort of cope with it is through through a whimsical lens or a satirical lens. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, I think uh while working on the piece and seriously working on the piece, um, at least for myself, I'm not thinking, oh, I want this to be fun or, oh, I want this to be, I do, I'm not thinking I want it to be anything except what it's kind of telling me to, it's becoming in front of me. So I don't go at it in a, in a focused way of any of the, whimsy or all that, which I guess is why all of our work is different because we're all putting our personality in it while we work on it, yeah. Which goes back to Susie's point about that you're all fun, quirky kind of people. Which, you know, it, it, the, so, that, so, that, so, the, so the fun, the silliness, the humor, the whatever comes from all of you in a natural way, an organic way. Yeah, Seems yeah, like. and yeah. It, <laughs> yeah I, I i thought no don't go into that one direction okay i'm good <laughs> well right that it's hard to just manufacture fun it it has to come exactly from... exactly we're not yeah yeah i mean i wouldn't consider myself a fun person i guess but you know i would oh well that's, that's <laughs> reflection that's reflection anyhow that's, that's have fun with of, you that's a heck of an admission to put on the radio that you don't consider yourself fun <laughs> well, I know. Well, yeah. I, well, when, no. Let's not go there. <laughs> but you've been smiling this whole interview so far, so I I think yeah. that's evidence of something. I guess the definition of fun, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm also thinking about when we talk about um, about artists dealing with the world, you know, in in a certain way, I, and it reminds me of the concept of the Dadaists and and that they were responding to. A pretty bad time in history too you know and the rise of fascism and and all the countries they were in and stuff like that and you know doing things doing things like nonsense poems and and just all this kind of like a way of trying to make sense of the world now without trying to i don't want to you know i don't want to get make too much of a burden on you guys about this but uh you're doing the same thing right now aren't you with your work are you trying to make sense of the 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 world Who, right me, yeah me well, any of you, but I, start with I, you. Uh, I guess I'm trying to make sense of myself, but I have to, I have to, I have to backpedal because, you know, the serious thing to put on the radio, I'm not fun. The only reason I mean to say that is because I don't like to go to parties. That's all. 
Uh, but like, but everyone else can start talking about how the how you know the dealing with the world. Well, you know, parties can sometimes be very intimidating and scary and uh, and, and chaotic. Oh yeah, you know. oh yeah. Uh -huh. it, you know, a one-on-one party's good. You know, I've done plenty of Irish goodbyes at parties, so you know, I I, I understand. Um, but uh, but but but. I guess part of me wonders, like too, when I when I mentioned the thing about Dadists, is uh, I I don't I don't sense myself that there is a movement with a label like that happening uh, in any part of the world with artists right now. But but at the same time, artists are always responding to what's going on in the world, and I don't know if it's just a matter of historical perspective later to look back and and identify artists' work in a certain way. But I guess I, I you know, I, I, and I, I'm not sure exactly where my question is here. I just, I'm just sort of posing this thought about uh, is, is what, is what artists are doing in a very larger sense right now going to be perceived somehow in the future as a movement in reaction to the sort of craziness in the world and what I think of sort of, uh, you know, to me, I feel like the world, at least America, but in other countries we see too, but. Um, is trying so hard to go backwards in time, you know, and sort of reverse what we've defined as progress. And so our, what, what, what do you think? Keith, let me ask you, I have a feeling you, you might have an answer. To that. Um, like, are artists, are artists doing a good enough job of responding to this? I don't think artists often know what they're doing in spite of those horrible statements that they blathery things that they post everywhere they're surfing the zeitgeist they it will be understood later and mm -hmm. i hope hope they live long enough to find out what they did um people ask me why robots um and I haven't been able to answer the question, but the other day I realized what I've done with them in my heart is very much the same thing that Gustav Weigland did in Frogner Park in Oslo. Now, Weigland is totally unappreciated in the modern world. Um, this is fantastic humanist expression. Um, I'd say on a level or beyond Michelangelo. I'm just so impressed with this stuff. I had forgotten all about this guy until I was thinking about the robots and their stiffness, their stylishness, their stylization. Um, and there it is. I mean, he's been in my life a long time and receded into the background and comes forward every once in a while. But uh, the robots, owe a lot to his humanism. Uh, and I think that's in line with what you're saying, bringing humanity, the good things about humanity forward in a time of conceptual art and a lot of other boring stuff. <laughs> well, and I kind of feel like what you're saying is in a way it's like you, what I'm asking is maybe an impossible question for a contemporary artist working. Cause like you say, surfing the zeitgeist, and we've already talked about how, for all of you, your work is so organic. It comes from you. You're not trying to create art that's very separate or apart from yourself. Julie, what's what are your thoughts about this? Um, <clears throat> absolutely not. I, it's not a separate from myself. Whatever, yeah. whatever kind of art is separate from an artist, you know. <laughs> I just well, I think, I think we can imagine people like, let's say, doing doing commissions and things like that. I mean, it all comes from whatever skill or talents you have, but it's at the yeah. same time, that's not personal in the way that I think all of your work is personal. Yeah, it, I think it's extremely personal with this group, and that's why this group has formed. Um, yeah. Why do we even do this? I have to do something. <laughs> Do, well, I mean, Julie, do you spend a lot of time asking yourself that question or you, you just do? When I'm, when I finish a piece, I feel terrible because I don't have 
a goal, a, you know, a purpose. Because it's finished. And then I clean the studio. Oh, God, so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> like right now, I need to start something. I think I'll drive to Louisville with a bunch of sculptures crammed into a scion. <laughs> <laughs> And that can be an inspiring trip. Ooh, well, wow. so let me ask you that. So you're going to come to Louisville and bring your sculptures and be there for the opening and the talk and all those kind of things. So when this show is, and it'll be up for a while, but after all of that experience, will you, will, do you think that will inspire you? Will you go home and immediately feel uh, excited about making work from, from getting together with everybody? Um. I don't know. I, I used to visit Nancy every summer and we would make art. And that was very inspiring. But hanging a show, I don't know. I don't know. I'll be glad that they're, they're out of my house. Oops. <laughs> Bad attitude. <clears throat> um, I don't know. Good question. Well, that's an honest attitude, though. I mean, it's and it's a part of it that I think a lot of people that don't make art and not, and not and don't don't have good close relationships with artists or galleries, you know, um, there's a lot about art that is not always fun. I'm not not everybody necessarily loves installation. Not everybody necessarily <laughs> loves, you know, being interviewed or having to write a statement or whatever. I mean, I think I think the statements you guys have are very individual, very unique, and and much less academic. Than what we tend to see uh, uh, be a, lo a lot of our statements, you know, and I think which is what Keith was referring to a second ago about there's there's a real demand upon artists now to be able to write about your work as much as you'd make the work sometimes, you know, to be able to express that, whether it be statements or grants and applications and submissions and all that kind of stuff. But um, so we just have a few minutes here. So I just wanted to, uh, in fact, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. If there's anything anybody wanted to say and didn't get to say, because I didn't ask well, the right question. Um, I just want to say in regards to, in general, to this question of, say, seriousness and world issues and responding to the stuff of the world around us, that um, if all we do in response is results in expressions of anger, discontent, contention, rebellion, cynicism. what cynicism, what we're saying about the world and what we're teaching about the world is that's what humans do. Hmm. And I think we have to have a reason to want to change the world. And that's to make a world of contentment, of hmm. plenty, of beauty, of kindness, of silliness, so if nobody presents that, where do we go? So that's what I want to say. No, that's what we're doing before I was right, right. So Zach is hope. hope well, to... in my in my vision, it's a part of that, yes. But I don't know about the other three, but certainly for me, yeah. I mean, you have to show something good about humanity, or what's the point? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we that's what we count on artists to do. And there's plenty of artists who do lean into the cynicism and and yes. uh, negativity. <laughs> so so maybe that's the great value of, of Zach as a group. Yeah, we're leaning the other direction. We're leaning the other, uh, you're leaning the other direction. Yeah, Keith, uh, long ago asked for a statement. I said, I believe in an art you can dance to. And I'll, I've always hung on to that. I believe that. Like, sure. Okay. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, uh, Susie Zimmer, Julie Edberg, Nancy Courier, and Keith Cleesby's It Spells Zek. Thank you all for being here and doing this with me. Uh, the show uh, runs at Pyro from August 5th through the 28th. Again, the opening reception is the 5th from 6 to 9 p.m where you can meet all these wacky people. And the gallery talk, uh, there's a gallery talk that same weekend, Sunday uh, at 2 p.m. So, uh, Zek at Pyro. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir.